the past couple of weeks, we discussed the questions concerning the Torah, the origin of the Torah, proof that the Torah is divine. And we spoke about how it is important to understand that the Torah that we have has two parts to it, Torah Shebikhtav, Torah Shebalteh, the, the written word and the oral word. And the two are inseparable. That it would not be possible to understand the Torah Shebikhtav, the written word, without the oral tradition. The two of them are called Torah, but they're divided into two, meaning that some of it we're familiar with because it is written. The other part of it is also written today, but once upon a time it was not written. It was not even allowed to be written. And the only, the only reason why the Torah Shebaal Peh, the oral tradition, is written today, most of it, not all of it, is because et la sot la shem. This is a time to do for Hashem, a time that unfortunately many Jews have become so distant from the Torah. Heferu mitzvotecha, heferu toratecha. They have gone against the Torah. They have not fulfilled the Torah. They have to be therefore taught and guided. And how are we going to teach them, especially when we don't have the ability to retain so much information as they did in the, in the past? So ever since the Mishnah was written after the destruction of the temple several hundred years later by Rabbi Yudah Nasi, much of the Torah Shebal Peh that was oral has been written down. We're going to see which parts have not really been written down and can never really be written down. Nevertheless, the Mishnah that we have today and followed by the Gemara, the Talmud, consists of a great part of that Torah Shebal Peh, all the halachot, the details, that are not written in the Torah Shebechtav, that we need to have in order to fully understand the text. What we're going to cover today is an explanation or the question as to why the Torah Shebaal Peh at one time was not allowed to be written down. What was wrong with writing down? As the Gemara Masechet Gitin says, the Pasuk says, You should write these words. And it is another Pasuk, According to the words that I have given you, apparently orally. Nothing about writing them down. How could you reconcile the two Pasukim? that which was said orally, that which was written down, you cannot say orally, and that which was said orally, you cannot write them down. So we have two questions. Why can't we write down? Why weren't we allowed to write down that which was oral? And why can't we say orally, balpe, something which is written down in the Torah Shebechtav? That's the halacha even today, by the way. A pasuk, in its entirety cannot just be said by heart. A little bit later on I will explain how is it then that we say many Pesukim by heart. Not from the Sidur and not from the Chumash. But I think you, you get the idea. Th these are the two questions. Why could we not have written down the Torah Shebaal Peh, which is part of our tradition, and why can't we not say that which is oral, that which is written down, why can it be verbalized Balpe. So let's just give a brief introduction for those of you who have not been here today uh, in the past as to how special this Torah is. This is not an ordinary book. As the Torah says, Vamiktav Miktav Elokim. It's not a regular book. It is a divine book. And this divine book contains a lot more information than what you just see on the surface. It is very misleading. And actually, many people think it's just a book of stories. It documents a little bit about the creation. It tells us a little about the Jewish people, how they came about, how they were in Egypt, how they left, and about the passing of Moshe. That's how it ends, pretty much. Unless, of course, you continue with the prophets. So on the surface, if you read it, especially if you read the English translation or some other language, it doesn't seem like uh, something unique, other than perhaps that it's very well composed, it's very poetic, 
It's very creative. What an incredible story. That's why they made movies in Hollywood from the story of Yosef, right? From the story of Moshe with the split in the Red Sea. I think that was Universal Studios. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so this really does serve some purpose. It's a good book, but it's not an ordinary book. For those of you who attended the series that I did on the Kabbalah, I discussed the various teachings of the Kabbalah, and one of them was a concept called Pardes. Pardes means that the Torah really has four layers. When we're looking at the text on the top, reading it literally, it's called Pshat. Pshat means literal. And even that which is Pshat is not always literal. Without the commentaries, without the Midrashim, you may not even know the Peshat of the Pasuk. The verse may not make any sense. But Peshat is the simplest way of understanding the text of the Torah. That is the pay of the word Pardes. Pardes means an orchard. And in this orchard, in this vast information, you have information that is Peshat. Literal, you have remis, that which is insinuated or hinted. It's not clear in the text. You have drash, you have the additional derashot. Derashot are additional interpretations or things that can be inferred and learned out. And you have the sod, which is the secrets, that which is more mystical in nature, which is also embedded in the text and cannot be seen on the surface. Can I have a question? Yeah, go ahead. Is Sod synonymous with Kabbalah? Yeah, a lot of the Kabbalah is pretty much the Sod. So when we're talking about Kabbalah, which aspect are we talking about? We're actually talking about the Remez too. The Remez and the Sod. Because there's a lot of Remez which is also Kabbalah. Kabbalah meaning that, that which we have received orally, but not everybody received it orally. As we discussed it, I don't want to review all the whole lecture of Kabbalah, but Kabbalah meant that which was received by the very few, by the very few who were prepared uh, emotionally, uh, psychologically, mentally, uh, to receive all that information which not every human being can grasp and fully comprehend. And in order, in order to guarantee that the Torah is transmitted accurately, especially the secrets of the Torah that not everybody is privy to, the students who were learning it had to be qualified. There are, that part of the Torah is, of course, more difficult to comprehend. Not everybody is, is really uh, pulled in the direction of learning it because a lot of it is abstract and difficult to comprehend. That's the Kabbalah. But in trying to understand a little bit of just Torah, I gave you this example because we must remember that the Torah has various layers to them. And when we're reading the Peshat, the story, that's not all that there is. There's a lot more behind it. So I'm going to give you just a few quick examples because I don't want to use the projector too much today. But I brought it just for you to see a couple of quick examples of each one of the four in one pasuk. There are many, but I'm going to give you just an example. Peshat. Bereshit bara lokim Hashem created the world. Right? How does it say that Hashem created the world? In the beginning. But in the beginning, Hashem does not create the heavens and the earth. The Torah is not telling us the order. There are many translations of the Chumash, of the Torah. And they may, may have, most of the time, the wrong translation. How do we translate this Pasuk? Not in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, because the Torah is not telling about the order. The order is not that. That's not the order in which the world was created. So how do you read it? You read it as follows. In the beginning, when God was creating the heaven and earth, at that time when he was in the process of doing it, the whole world, the universe, was tov avo. You see, all I did was add the word when. In the beginning, when God was <coughs> in the midst, the process of doing this, aretz aita tov avo, right? So that is exactly as it is explained in our tradition, but not in the translations, in the bad translations of the Humash. Peshat meaning the literal 
understanding of this pasuk is when Hashem was in the process of creating the world, the, the land of the world, the universe was tov of all, the choshech at it was all void. That's pshat. What's that? What would be a remez? Remez could be a gematria too, the numerical equivalent of some word. So let's see the same pasuk, and let's see a remez of sorts. What could be insinuated in this pasuk? Bereshit bara, the rabbis tell us, berosh hashanah nivra. It was created in the beginning of the year, of the Jewish year. When is that? Rosh Hashanah. The word Berosh Hashanah Nivra is the same gematria, is equivalent <coughs> to Bereshit Bara. If you add up the numerical value of Bereshit Bara, you'll get 1,116. The same numerical value of Berosh of Hashanah Nivra. Mm. So you see something that the rabbis tell us that is insinuated in the words Bereshit Bara. At what point? When did he do it? Because as you know, in the Gemara there are two opinions. Was it in Nisan? Was it in Rosh Hashanah? Well, here we have a remez that it was on Rosh Hashanah. It's the same numerical value. And Gematria is a type of remez. A numerical value. As you know, in Hebrew, every letter has a value, right? So when you add them up, if another word adds up to the same value, it may or may not have significance. Here it does. It's a remez. Rabbi, that it happens in Rosh Hashanah. Yes? This is actually saying the world created then or Adam and Eve were created then? The world. Okay. But remember, Adam and Eve pretty much within a couple of days, right? Were created. Close. They were created in six days, right? Yeah. So it's very close. But that's when everything begins. That's true. Okay, let's see. Remes of Sofetevot. Sofetevot means you can have Rashetevot and Sofetevot. The, the first letter of every word, or the last ending letter of every word, in a particular order, you may see another word. What, what are the last three letters of the words Bereshit, Bara Elohim? Tav, Aleph, Mem. What does that stand for? Emet. Truth. That that is the seal of truth of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that it's created with truth, with justice. A remez using the system called Sofetevot, the last letters, one after another. Just a different kind of remez. There's, of course, the remez that we spoke about in codes. Embedded in codes, there's all kinds of codes in all sorts of ways to be found in the Torah. And we spoke about the code of Torah with a skip of 50 letters, 49 letters in between. The 50th letter between Taf and Vav, Vav and Reish, Reish and Hey. You have a, the word Torah. There are many words, many ideas embedded in codes of equal distant letters, as it's called. In certain equivalent skips, that they all appear, meaning uh, all sorts of things. Another kind of remez. Habadrash, Bereshit bara lokimit hashamayim v'taaretz. The Midrash tells us why did the Torah use the word Bereshit? You could have said Barishona, Ba'atchala, in the beginning. Why use the word Bereshit? Bereshit is not commonly used as a word to say in the beginning. So the rabbi tells Bishwila Torah Shinikret Reshit, because of the Torah, the whole world is created for the Torah. Without the Torah, there's no purpose, no use for the creation of the world. And the Torah is called Reshit, Ubishwili Israel Shinikru Reshit, Wato. Am Israel is called Reshit, the very beginning, the very first the chosen people. So there is a special quality to the word Bereshit, and that is why, that's at least one reason why the Torah uses the word Bereshit. That's a drasha. A drasha is a, an additional interpretation, information that can be inferred, that can be learned out, that of course is handed down to us. It's not just made up. People can come up with their own drashot. That as long as it does not contradict something, you can, you're allowed to say it. But this is a drasha that we have, of course, from the rabbis, there is a reason why the word Bereshit is used and not, other, not another word. And then we have Sod. Bereshit bara lokim tashamayim v'taaretz. Look at the word Bereshit. If you divide it in two, the Zohar says it's com, it com, it's consists of two words. Barashi, he created the world in six days. But not only is the world created in six days, this physical world consists of six angles. Number six represents the physical world. We have north, south, east, and west. You have up and down. That is what we do with the nanoim of the lulav. When we start shaking the lulav, 
right? In the, bar- in the six points, the Magin David has six points, right? Number seven is spiritual. Shabbat is holy, it's spiritual. It's not the physical world. That is why we abstain from physical work, right? All the sevens are holy. Kolash Viyot Kodesh. So here's an example of a sod, and there's a lot of sodot in this, wor- in this word, but one of them has to do with the idea of six. What does six represent? Okay, what I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you that there's a lot more to this uh, Torah than appears to the naked eye. There's a lot of things that are learned in the Torah by way of analyzing the text. It's called Kri Uchtiv. Many times you will find in the Torah a word that is written missing a letter or a word that is written with an extra letter. And sometimes it's like this, and sometimes it's like that. Even the prophet Eliyahu, the Sefer Malachi, the last prophet, for some reason Eliyahu is missing above there. Now we have some of the explanations as to why some words are written in, such a, in, such, in a certain way. Besides the Kri besides the Gimatriot that we saw examples of, besides Rashet Tevot and Safet Tevot, in other words, all the kinds of ways of being able to see more information from the same text, you also have the tzurat autiyot. You also have the design, or the shape, I should say, of every letter of the alphabet. What you're about to see is the Hebrew alphabet, as it is used today, it's called the Ktav HaShuri. There was a time that they used the Ktav HaIvri, the, whole, the old Hebrew script that the Samaritans still use in writing their Sefer Torah. And I'm not going to get into this subject as to why it was once written this way, once written that way. This is a holy script. According to most opinions, this is the script in which Moshe Rabbeinu at least wrote the very first Sefer Torah that he gave to each tribe. And number 13, the Sefer Torah number 13, he actually put, was put inside the Ark. So today, if you would open up the Ark, you would find the tablets, the second pair. You would find the old pair that are broken and you would find one Sefer Torah that Moshe Rabbeinu wrote on his last day of his life. Okay. What is that? Of course, there's other items there. Okay. There are other items next to the Ark that were interred uh, underneath the Harabai, the Temple Man. The flask of Man, the Mated, the staff of Aharon, a flask of the Shemina Mishcha, the oil to anoint, that was used to anoint, and so forth. There's a few things there. But anyway, this is the Khtar that according to most opinions, the Luchot, at least, were written or engraved in. And this is a very special Khtar, just like Lashon Kodesh, the language is a very special language. As I explained briefly, there are no synonyms. Every word represents something else. You have, for example, a poor man. You, how do you say poor in Hebrew? You can say, Ani Raj Dal Ve'evion. Right? Four ways of saying poor, but they all are different degrees of poverty. He could have been once upon a time rich, and now he became poor, he's called something else than if he was always poor all his life. So even though they all form in the same thing, they're synonyms, as we call in English, but they're not true synonyms. The Lashona Kodesh is very special that every word actually designates something. And how do you know what the word means? If you did not know any Hebrew, and all you knew were the, in, the significance of every letter of the alphabet, you would be able to figure out the meaning of the word. You never learned Hebrew, Lashon Kodesh, but you know the significance of the letters, what each letter represents, then you would be able to figure it out. For example, Adam, the rabbi tells in the Midrash, he was able to give names to animals. The elephant he called a peel, the monkey he called a kof, right? The, the fish he called a dog. Why did he do that? I mean, why did these animals have this particular name? Because if you look at each letter, and you add them together, put them together, and you know the significance of every letter, you will see the pe'ula, or the activity that that animal performs based on the letters that it has. That is his name, that is his essence. We don't have time to go through the whole alphabet, this was another lecture completing, and we're just gonna go through a few examples so that you can see how aleph consists of a vav and two yuds, really, right? And there's great significance to its number and to what it represents. 
There is great significance to the bet on how it looks, the shape, and what it means. Same thing with the gimel, right? What it means, the numerical value of each letter, what its, uh, what its action is, what is the gimel acting? In other words, what is it doing? It looks like somebody walking. It has feet in the bottom, right? And uh, whenever the gimel is in a word, or the dalit, or any letter, depending on the position in the word, it does something. It gives you the same performance. And once you know the performance of every letter, then you, when you see a whole word with the various letters, then you say, oh, the, the, what this word really means is to shatter. I'll give you an example. To shatter because the letters containing that word, in that verb, shatter, I see pieces, <laughs> I see something breaking up, and I see something multiplied. Because shatter means many, many pieces, right? Breaking up. So all of that you will find in the Hebrew word. Anyway, I only sh I'm only going to show you a couple, and I'm going to come only till Dalit, and I have a reason for that. Because you can take a mitzvah and sometimes even figure out what is the purpose of that mitzvah. What I, what I chose as an example is Hashavat Aveda. Hashavat Aveda means you, you are walking down the street, it's a Jewish neighborhood, and you find a Rolex watch. Can you keep it? No. You have to put an announcement, you have to let people know you found a watch, a watch and they have to come and identify it, give you simanim. Right? Eventually, somehow, you have to bring that watch to its rightful owner. Big mitzvah, big favor, it's expensive, right? You can't just keep it. You have to make the effort to find its rightful owner. So I once gave a discussion about this mitzvah. It's interesting that somebody loses something. The fact that somebody has to return it, that's an act of kindness. The Torah says you have to be kind. I mean, after all, do a favor, do a mitzvah. Why did that man lose what he lost? Now we know something from the past, Baruch Hashem, many of us have learned that there's nothing that happens by, mis by, by chance, right? Yisurim is kaparat avonot, if somebody is suffering, whether it's an illness or something, it's an atonement for something he did wrong, we know that everything is controlled from above. What would be the reason why somebody lost something? Why did he lose? I mean, eventually he's going to recover it, right? We're talking about somebody's going to find it and give it back to him. So why should he lose it to begin with? This is just one idea. If you look at the word Aveda in Hebrew, the root of the word consists of three letters. Aleph, Bet, and Dalet. Right? Isn't that interesting that almost all the letters from the alphabet from the very beginning are there contiguously, one after another? What comes after Aleph? Bet. What comes after Bet? Gimel. And after Gimel comes out, but wait a minute, Gimel is missing. You have Aleph, Bet, Dalet, Aveda, right? The root is Aleph, Bet, Dalet. So where is the Gimel? Why would the Gimel be missing? Rabbis tell us the reason why a Gimel is close to a Dalet is because the Gimel has something to do with being kind, with doing for others. It is a peula of going, it is a, is a, it is a peula or an activity of initiative especially with gemilut chasadim, gomel, to do for others, to do, to do for others what they need. And dalet is dal, the poor. So gomel dalim, gimel is close to dalet because part of, of being a good person is being considerate and charitable. And that is why gimel is close to dalet. That is what the rabbis tell us. Okay. If a gimel is missing here, means perhaps that individual who lost something needs to be taught a lesson in generosity. Perhaps he wasn't as generous, perhaps he wasn't as kind and considerate. Look, somebody's going to go out of his way and take your watch and find you out where you live and bring it back to you. You see? You see how other people are nice and considerate? That's something for you to learn. Perhaps, and perhaps, this is a lesson for this individual who lost an object, an expensive object, that here is somebody who went so far as to locate you and to give you back what you love. You see, that's, the, that's what you need to learn and be kind and considerate to others as well.
Okay, now just a, a couple examples that I wanted you to see of how the letters interact between themselves and how there is importance to them. Now, not only is there an importance to the tsurata ot, to the shape of the letter, but there is also an importance to something that many of you perhaps never realized, never paid attention, because you're not writing mezuzot or tefillin or sifer Torah. There's something called tagin. Tagin are the crowns. If you look closely at the mezuzah, Right? You look, if you, if you ever opened up a mezuzah, you will see certain letters have crowns on them. Certain crowns. So what they're for? We have a tradition. We may, not, we may not all know exactly what each particular tag means, but Rabbi Akiva was known to be able to learn from every tag and tag, on every letter, many, many halachot, details of halachot, just by looking at the tagim, just by looking at the crowns. All these little details just from letters. So we see from that so far that there's a lot more information that we don't even realize that is in the same text. It's not just a pshat. It's not just a literal meaning. And that is why the Zohar says that whoever thinks the literal meaning, the story, is the whole Torah, is making a big mistake. He's forgetting that the real neshama, the soul of the Torah, is deeper, is inside. It's, the story is just the levush. The story is just what clothes the, the, the Torah. It's just for those who are trying to have a very, very basic understanding of what's going on. But don't think for a moment, the Zohar says, that the story of Yosef, the story of Cain and Hebel, the story of uh, the Jewish people in Egypt or in the desert, that's the Torah. No, that, that's just the Levush. That's on the top, including the mitzvot, the mitzvot, the commandments themselves. That's not the entire Torah either. That's all part of the levush. That's all part of the surface on the top. There's a lot more going on in the neshama, in the essence of the Torah that we don't even realize. The Gaon of Vilna goes a step further. He says, this is based on tradition, that everybody's life, everybody's individual life is merumaz, is insinuated in the Torah. What will happen to him? <coughs> His name, and all that will happen to him in his life, everything is in If you knew how to look for it, you would be able to see who you will marry, how many kids you will have, how long you will live. If you, know, if you knew how to search for that information, everything is in the Torah. And he gave some examples. The example that I'm going to share with you is another idea that he shared. And that is that in the word Bereshit alone, just the first word of the Torah, Bereshit, in that one word of how many letters, Six, right? Six letters. You can find all the mitzvot of the Torah. Every mitzvah. We have 613. If you know how to read it right, you will see it in the word Bereshit. Okay, so the students wanted to challenge him, to test him. Okay, Rabbi, tell us where the mitzvah of Pidyon Ben is insinuated in Bereshit. Pidyon Ben means the first male born to a mother, Jewish mother, who's not a Kohenet or Leviya, neither is her husband a Kohen or Levi. It was not a cesarean birth. There was no girl beforehand, and there was no miscarriage before that. In other words, it's the first one. There's something called Pidyon Kor, right? He's holy. During the time of, uh, before, actually, before the Masa Egel, before the Sin of the Golden Calf, they had a tremendous responsibility, a tremendous very important position, that was pretty much what the Kohanim took over later. They will be restored to that position because they're holy, they're the first, they will, re, they will be given that important position in the Bet HaMikdash that will be rebuilt very soon. But anyway, a Bechor, a firstborn to a mother, because there's a firstborn to a father too. Right? A father can, has his firstborn, but a, a father can have a firstborn from many wives. If he has two wives, it could be the firstborn to the first wife, the firstborn to the second wife. As long as they meet those conditions, there will be a pidyon bechor. What's a pidyon bechor? We redeem him from the Kohen after 30 days. In other words, he's alive, he's well, he's healthy, he's lived for 30 days. And we give him the Kohen some money in exchange for redeeming him and having him being able to use him for something which is unholy, basically. Otherwise, he's holy. He belongs to the service of the Bet HaMikdash. That's the mitzvah that we have even today. Anybody who has a first boy may have the opportunity to do that. He may have because not everybody has a natural birth. 
some women or husbands are Kohen or Levi, right? So that will, of course, disqualify. But if you do that mitzvah, obviously it's a very special mitzvah. So the, the students asked the rabbi, where do you see that mitzvah in the word that you said Bereshit? Okay? So everybody remembers what the word Bereshit looks like, right? Bet, Resh, Aleph, Shin, Yud, Taf. Bereshit, six letters, right? So it's very easy. That's an easy one, he says. Ben, Rishon, Ahar, Sheloshim, Yom, Tivdeh. First son, after... 30 days you shall redeem. Okay. Took the same letters, right? As this would be called, I think, in English, an acronym, right? Where the, all the, the words add up based on one letter appearing in the word. And it was each letter of the word representing another word, an entire right. word, right? Right. Yeah. Yes, Example, and I've heard some who can actually. Uh, show you additional mitzvot. I'm sure if you thought about it, maybe you'd be able to figure it out yourself, but that's what the Gaon of Vilna says as another example of how much information is embedded in this Torah. Okay, so now we've come to our question of the night. So this Torah, Shebikhtav, that has so much information, right, cannot easily be given over in any other way. As we will see, there's a certain sensitivity about this Torah. There's a vast amount of information. So before I begin to give you all the reasons, or some of the reasons at least, of why the Torah that is balpe, that is oral, cannot be written down, let me just tell you what the Rambam says about the Torah Shebaal The Rambam basically says, Torah Shebaal consists of three parts. One is all that Moshe received, that was not written down, all the details that we discussed last week, all the halachot, how to slaughter an animal, doesn't say in the Torah, right? It just says to slaughter. But how do you do that, right? How do you build a sukkah, by the way? That's another example we didn't discuss it, but it says just, just sit down in a sukkah. Uh, well, do I need, can I use a, a tent for a sukkah, right? It says don't do work on Shabbat, right? What is work? All that is in the Torah Shabbat Peh. Without that, we don't know how to perform the mitzvah. So the Ramah says the first part of Torah Sheval Peh are all the details that Moshe received, including that which is considered Halakha le Moshe Mesinai. Halakha le Moshe Mesinai is a special category of details that, are, that the rabbis, of course, received directly from Sinai that are not directly learned from the text. It's not directly learned from the text. There are certain things that are Halakha. Moshe told us this way. Many things are basically learned from the text, one way or another. You have to find it out. How? There might be an extra letter. There might be a missing letter. Right? And there are many examples of mitzvot and details of mitzvot that are inferred or learned from letters. But Allah Khalim Moshe Misinai is, that is what Kibalnu we received. That's the first part. These are the main parts of the Allah Chot, the Torah Shabal Peh. Then you have a second part. The second part of Torah Shabal Peh is there are certain rules that the Torah allows the Chachamim to use to learn other things from. In other words, they were given the rules, and if you apply these rules properly, you can learn what is right from what is wrong based on following certain rules. Okay, if the rule is such and such in this situation, and this situation is exactly the same as this one, because there are similar words used in both texts, and this te word in this text is central, that means if we learn something from that word here, we can use that same word to apply here. Found this is a rule, a rule of comparisons. We're not dealing with apples and apples, but we're dealing with certain similarities, and these similarities based on certain rules allow us to arrive at certain conclusions as to the halakha or the detail of a mitzvah that we may not know. There are many, many things that may come up in the future that were not written down. Not everything was written down. So therefore, what are we going to use to be able to decide future situations? We're going to use these klalim. And these, of course, klalim are able to help us in many situations. 
There's one important difference the Rambam says between the first type of Torah Shabal Peh and this one I just told you. In the first type of Torah Shabal Peh that comes directly from Sinai, there is no machloket. <laughs> Eventually we'll be talking about machlokot. Why is there Bet Hilel? Why is there Bet Shammai? How come the Gemara is stuck? Heko, we don't know until Mashiach comes. Why are there various opinions about something that should be black and white? Why is there such a thing as a gray area? Why isn't everything clear? We'll talk about it another time. But what we need to know right now is that Rambam says that there's a certain part of Torah Shebal Peh that it is possible, unfortunately, that there will be machlokot. Machlokot means differences of opinion. Nevertheless, we must remember something. Differences of opinion is permitted as long as you do not contradict that which is, is already established. You can come along tomorrow and say, well, my opinion about this situation that came up in the world, or in the Jew, whatever, in the Jewish world, is such and such. You're entitled to give an opinion as long as what you say does not contradict anything that we know. If it does not contradict, it may be true. It may be acceptable. We don't know. You obviously have to back up your opinion. You have to prove it. You have to show. Just like when scientists, they have deal, when they want to prove something, right? It's not just a theory. They have to back it up. They have to show it, you know, and document their work. And the same thing with any halakha, psak halakha, that a rabbi who's a posek, the rabbi that wants to resolve uh, uh, what the halakha is in a very complex situation, he has to basically base it on something. And that something cannot, be, cannot contradict something which is already established. So therefore, the Rambam says, all of this is Torah Shabal Peh, because even the rules that the Chachamim received, they were given the jurisdiction, the Samchut, the authority to decide issues in, in the future as long as they use those rules. Then you have the third part of Torah Shabal Peh, and those are the Gezerot and the Takanot, the decrees, the various rulings that the rabbis gave from time to time over the history of our people, from generation to generation, including Min Hagim, that came about customs as a result of the Jewish diaspora. This is also Torah Shabal Peh. Because why did they institute it to begin with, all these additional things? Remember, they're not allowed to add to the Torah. The Torah says, lo tigra lo tosif. You cannot add, you cannot detract, you cannot remove, you cannot make changes. The Torah knew that there will be people, groups, that will try to make alterations. No changes allowed. And here the rabbis are adding, they're not adding something on the Torah itself. They're safeguarding the Torah. That they're allowed to do. They're allowed to safeguard. They're allowed to do what the rabbis call siyag. Siyag means offense. I don't want you to come to do halila vechaz, the terrible avera of nida. Right? Therefore, I'm going to safeguard you. I'm going to put a fence. I'm going to tell you, stay away. I'm going to tell you what not to do, even though the Torah doesn't say it, does not prohibit it, only as an additional precaution. So the rabbis knew what they were doing. They were smarter than us. Right? They were closer to Sinai. The tradition was much clearer and sharper to them than it is to us. They knew the circumstances very well. They knew human nature very well. We have to give them credit, right? And therefore, if they said something and they had the consensus too, and the power to say that this applies forever, then it may apply forever. There are certain things, however, that don't apply all over the world. And we discussed that. There are certain things that were only accepted in, the, in Europe and not accepted all over North African countries. For, for the, the, the famous example is, how many women can you have at one time? So Ashkenaz have one, Sephardic allowed to have two. The problem is that those Sephardic who want to have two women, they have to travel to Salt Lake City here. <laughs> because here in California, they won't allow it. Right? Yeah, many countries, of course, have disallowed bigamy. You can have two wives. And there's some husbands, of course, who can't even get along with one. So that's, a, that's another problem in itself. But according to the Torah, a man is allowed to have up to four, as long as he can afford them, and as long as, of course, they agree. Why would they agree, by the way? Why would women agree to be in the same house as another woman? There's a good reason why the Ashkenaz did not allow it. It was causing a lot of trouble. Well, maybe, maybe a particular woman is an orphan. Maybe she wants to be supported by this very generous, wealthy Jew who can afford it. He's going to take care of her, give her all the best jewelry, buy her as many pairs of shoes that she wants, right? 
and she's, she'd make her very, very happy, and he won't be abusive either. I mean, he'll be a nice guy. I mean, she, the problem is she may not get all his attention because he, she, you know, he has to share it to three other ones. But technically, there's no problem if she agrees and he agrees. It's beautiful. Differences arose in the diaspora, in the Galut of Am Yisrael, concerning certain details. But today, of course, everybody's coming back to Eretz Yisrael, and we all need to follow more or less the same halacha, but there's still different minhagim. And we'll talk about that another time, why these minhagim, all these customs came about to begin with. So getting back to our questions, so the Torah, Shebal Peh, the oral word, cannot be originally was not be able to, re, to be written down. Why not? Well, now we understand that this Torah is very complex. There's so many details. And because of the vast amount of details, it has to be preserved in a way that it, the details should not be forgotten. And the, one of the best ways to preserve it intact without any misunderstandings was to give it orally over not by writing it down. Now what happens when you write down certain information? When you write down certain information that is complex, it could be subject to interpretation. A lot easier than if it's handed down orally. So there was, at one time at least, when people were able to retain the information a lot better. And we're assuming that they were able to retain it well. They didn't forget what they learned. And they didn't. Because they took it seriously. Many of, it, many of those halakhot were actually applicable almost on a day-to-day -day basis. They were immersed in Torah. So therefore, if you were to write something down that is complex, it would be subject to interpretation, to misunderstanding, and then of course the real meaning, the real, the real halakha may be lost, may be forgotten. So some things needed to be transmitted only orally. Part of the Torah Shebal Peh also is important for it to be handed down directly from a teacher to the student. Directly. Let's say you pick up a book of medicine. You want to learn to be a doctor. Can you do that just by looking at a book? By reading all the information yourself? What's missing? Examples, experience. Examples, experience. What about questions and answers? Let's say you have questions. You can ask the book. There's a great emphasis on teacher-student in Jewish education. It's, and even though a lot of people like homeschooling, and I didn't say I'm against homeschooling. I mean, for some kids, maybe it's a, a possibility. But the kids are missing out a lot. Rabbis tell us, O Havruta, O Mituta that it's important for somebody to learn Torah with a chavruta. Chavruta means with a companion, with others. So there can be questions and answers. They can ask themselves, they can figure things out, they can criticize opinions. We talk about the older, of course, students who can use a chavruta, but even in, in, for younger children, there's an environment. Do you know that a lot of teachers received incredible answers to some of the most difficult questions from their own young students. Oh, I didn't think of that. What a bright answer from a five, six-year-old. You know, just out of the blue. How? They would never have thought of it. Kids, you know, with their imaginations can sometimes come up with a very interesting explanation or answer to a question. So there's a lot of benefits to school, there's a lot of benefits to having a relationship with a teacher, like you said, that has experience, that is knowledgeable, that will further clarify. And that is part of the importance of transmission of father to child, teacher to student, and so forth. There's an, also an emphasis in the Torah of memorizing certain things. Vishnantam Levanecha, the word Vishnantam is not just telamedotam, teach them, instruct them. Vishnantam lebanecha, that we say in the Kriyat Shema, is that you should repeatedly talk about it. In other words, you yourself and you to your children should continuously review that information. We're not talking about a time where texts were so easily available. And how are you going to review it if you're when you're on your way 
You can take your books, you can take your library with you. So a lot of the information and the, and the details, the ones that are really important, had to be reviewed, and how were they reviewed? You know, by heart. They needed to memorize, they needed to know many things by heart. A lot of the rules that we spoke about earlier, rules that you can learn other things from, they needed to be taught balpeh, because there are a lot of situations that will arise in the future that were not present at that time. So those rules had to be always kept in mind, always had to, had, had to be memorized very well because of situations that may arise. In other words, when one is teaching Torah, what happens, and this is very, very common in learning Gemara, very common, Dafka with Gemara, more than anything else. When teaching Gemara, you're not only teaching the information, you're teaching also derech limud, how to learn the Gemara, how to figure out, okay, let me see, what was bothering him that he asked this question? Well, well, why, why did Rashid Tosafot say what they said? What was bothering them? Why did they have to ask the question to begin with? They were being bothered because of something else, elsewhere, or some contradiction, apparent contradiction. That's called Derech Halimud. And today there are various schools, by the way, in Derech Halimud of Gemara. Lithuanians have their own Derech Halimud. Polish Jews had their own Derech Halimud. Polish and Hungarian Hasidic have their own. Sephardic Jews had a little bit of a different Derech Halimud. There's different ways of learning the Gemara. How much detail do you, how much depth? What do you try to analyze? And uh, this is, of course, a, a very uh, great challenge for teenagers who are coming into the, for the first time, to learn Gemara. But this is what really sharpens their mind. Gemara, more than anything else, really sharpens their mind. I even heard that in Israeli colleges, secular colleges, they have courses on Talmud for lawyers. <laughs> lawyers need to argue, need to... Uh, or prosecute or defend, and they have to have logic and reason. And where did they get for that from? From the discussions of the Gemara. The give and take of what happens is fascinating world in itself. That's called Derech Halimud. So all that Derech Halimud, the way of learning, the way of figuring things out, that had to be transmitted orally. You could not just write this down. It's never, never possible to figure this out on your own. Something that is given over orally is also uh, has a better chance of, of not having any, any interruptions, in other words, in the transmission, because it's going over, as we said before, directly from the source to the student. And every rabbi, for the most part, can, can say who his rabbi was, who his teacher was, up until Moshe Rabbeinu. Nobody, is a, nobody learned everything on his own. So there is a, by giving things over orally, you have this tradition that is going down directly from Sinai, un, almost basically uninterrupted. So there was a great emphasis on doing that, so there should be no interruption in the transmission of the Torah. Then, of course, there are parts of the Torah, there are Sodot that I spoke about before. Sodot are the, mis, are the secrets. You can't give that to every student. You can't write everything down. I can't teach all of you of the Kabbalah, every part of the Kabbalah. You know, maybe some things are not, will be prohibited from, me to, from saying it, from disclosing them. They may be misunderstood. Certain things have to be done privately, one-on-one. -on -one. Why? Because let's say I tell you something and you get up after the lecture and you leave. And you never had a chance to ask. You may, mis you may have misunderstood completely. You may have gotten the wrong idea altogether. So if this is a very sensitive topic, I cannot do it in public. It would have to be only one-on-one, -on -one, because I want to make sure that you understand. And then even, even if it's one-on-one, -on -one, it can't just be anybody. It has to be somebody that's qualified. That is why very few people today learn the heavy-duty Kabbalah, heavy-duty. Playing Kabbalah, there's schools all over the place. You just want to learn, there's a lot of books on it. But that's just superficial, that's just concepts, some ideas. Uh, or, or Jewish mysticism, but not real deep Kabbalah, which is not easy at all. And that's the part of the sodot, the secrets of the Torah that could not be given down 
to just anybody and was always therefore kept orally. Today, the Zohar has been written, has been published, Raziel Malak, Sefer Yetzirah, has been written, has been published, but I assure you, the most, most people could not understand every page in the Zohar, even though some of it is easy, and definitely not Raziel Malach and Sefer Yetzirah, which are much more complicated. Most people don't, maybe have never seen those books either, but they're, they're not easy to, to understand. Another reason why the, the oral tradition was not written down, back then at least, is that Hashem was concerned, of course, that the Goim should have no access to that. This is the precious Torah. The written word is something that had to be written down. Why even write down the written Torah? Why not just keep everything oral? Because you always have to have a source. You always have to be able to point out this is where it's coming from. You can't have everything oral. So we're always going to have something written. Okay? But nevertheless, there are certain things that Hashem did not want the Goim to have access to. As it is, look what happened, what they did with the written Torah. The Torah cannot be easily translated. And what did they do on Asarab et Tibet when they forced our rabbis to translate into 70 languages? Remember? That's one of the reasons we fast. Darkness came to the world on the day the Torah, the written Torah was translated. Asarab et Tibet, fast. Darkness came to the world because the Torah cannot be perfectly translated. There are some things that are not possibly to try. Cannot, it's not easy to translate. And today they have all these languages, all these versions and translations, and they're not always accurate. Therefore, I always make a point that a Jew should learn as much as possible from the original language. That he should see, for a fact, it does not say virgin. It says a young woman. In the, in the Hebrew, it does not say virgin. Well, the Christians will tell you, oh, I can show you that the prophet is talking about a virgin girl. I think you know what I'm talking about, right? Missionaries will try to prove it. You look in the original Hebrew. It doesn't say the word Betula. It says Alma. Alma is a young girl. It has nothing to do with virgin. But if you don't know the original language, you can easily be misled to believing, that, oh, maybe he has, good, he has a good point. It's written. No way in the world. If you know the original language, Rashon HaKodesh, you'll be spared a lot of misunderstandings. If the Goim would ever decree, as they did during the time of the Greeks, that we should not learn Torah, all that oral Torah that we have is obviously not accessible to them either. Another explanation as to why a lot of it had to be preserved orally. Until when? Until, unfortunately, the time came where people would not be able to retain. The Bet HaMidash is destroyed, and the rabbis are seeing that the Jews are about to disperse all over the world. If we don't write it down, the main Torah Shabbat Peh, they're not going to know it. That is, the, the Mishnah comes about, the Gemara, the Halachot, the Shulchan Aruch, the Rambam, everything. All of that is a Torah Shebal Peh that has been written down for good reason. Only because we had no choice, otherwise we would forget everything. Some things are very difficult to write down. It's too difficult, too complex, there's so many details. That's another idea of why it had to be transmitted orally. There's a lot of uh, interpretation sometimes about a certain word, a certain text, a certain mitzvah. There may be other ideas. Not everything is possible to write down. Eventually, things will be learned. Eventually, things will be inferred, depending on the situations that arise. OK, now, real briefly, why can't we say verbally that which is written down? That was the second question. That which is written down, why can't I say it verbally? Well, first of all, the halacha is today that every pasuk, any pasuk, that sheshagur bepi, that I'm very well versed and I say it all the time, Shema Israel, am I allowed to say it balpe? That's the reason why certain pasukim we're allowed to say balpe. We can say it by heart because they are shagur. In other words, we are fluent in them. And this fluency gives you a little bit of an idea of what would happen if we would not be fluent. If we would not be fluent in a particular pursuit, we would make a mistake. And oy va boy to us, if we make a mistake on something that is clearly written in the Torah, you know what that could do? I mean, it could we can eventually go on 
living our lives thinking that this is the right way, that this is the right understanding about something which is clear in the Torah. No, no, the Torah does not want us to do that. No mistakes should come about as a result of saying something by heart. Look at the text before you say it, make sure. Rabbis always tell us to always continuously review Torah. Why? I already learned it. Hashem intentionally made us forget, so we shouldn't ever come and say, okay, Baruch Hashem, I learned the Torah, I'm going to retire. Retire? No, I'm going to make you forget, so you always review the Torah. There's a lot, always something new to learn. And besides, there's so many details. You can't remember everything. So we always have to learn Torah. Now, so if it ever happens that we don't review the text, and we have a big question, and we haven't been learning this chapter recently, we can make, a person can easily make a mistake. A rabbi that has brought a big question, a complex question to the side. Big question. Okay, is this chicken taref or not? Well, yeah, question. He really has to check the text. He has to check the halakha, he has to check the source. Before he really renders a decision, he may be, he may be making a mistake. You don't, you don't behave with such great self-confidence when it comes to dealing with issues of life and death, of mutar nasur, tamen tahor. You could be making a big mess. And therefore, one always has to check the text. Therefore, do not say things orally, verbally, in other words, with that which is written down because we don't want you to make a mistake and change the, the, the real text from what it really is. There's also a difference between Torah Shebechtav and Torah Shebalpeh, the oral and the written, and we, we always need to distinguish between the two. So that which is Balpeh, we say Balpeh, that which is written down, we learn it from the text. We don't therefore switch the two. Whatever was meant to be written down is, written, is read from the text itself. That's another idea. One more idea, anything that is written down has great importance to the way it is written, as we saw some examples. The, the text, the Ktav, the Tzurat Otiyot, the shape of the letters, has great importance. It may lose some of the value if we take that text and we start teaching it without giving an example. Imagine me talking about certain ideas here without showing you the examples. You would not have appreciated what I'm talking about it. But once you see it, it's a lot different. So certain things had to be kept written down and being learned from the text. You know, it reminds me about the Yemenite Jews. The Yemenite Jews, many of them were very, very poor. They did not have too many texts, books, sidurim. If you go today to Israel, go to a Yemenite shul where there's still elderly temanim, Yemenites, you will see something incredible. You may see it. You'll see somebody praying from a sidur backwards. The sidur is backwards. You won't be able to read it. He's able to read it. What is he doing with a backwards sidur? That is how he learned. What do you mean that's how he learned? Yes, when he was in class, there was only one sidur, one chumash, and the kids sat around. Those who were in the back of the book learned the alphabet backwards. Those that were on the angle on the side learned it on an angle. Everybody learned it from a different angle, and some of them just know how to read upside down, backwards. Today, I think there's enough sidurim all over the place, and. Not too, too many. Because they bring the, sh the, the cemetery uh, boxes and boxes yeah. of the door, which are perfect addition. Yeah, not, not everybody's learning how to read upside down and backwards. Anyway, as we said before, the language is also very important. The, there is a great need for Jews, at least, to be able to learn the Torah in the Hebrew language in the Lashon Kodesh, because learning it in a different language will not give you the whole scope of what is written. And it may give you the wrong interpretation too. By reading, by seeing the real letters, everything comes to life. There's so much going on in the text. This letter is missing. Why does, the word, why does it say here sukkah without a vav? And here it says sukkah with a vav. It's pronounced the same thing, pretty much. You know, in the English, you would be missing all of that. How could you figure all that from the English text? Very important for one to learn Hebrew, Lashon Kodesh to be able to really appreciate what he's saying in the prayer book and what he's learning in the Torah. I just want to spend the last three, four minutes 
just talking a little bit about the importance of learning Torah. As you know, we all have a yetzer. We all have an evil inclination. We're, we're only humans. And the rabbis tell us that the most powerful antidote for that yetzer is learning Torah. The Torah actually cools us off. The Torah makes us more happy, it removes depression, it keeps us busy, it educates us, it illuminates us, it guides us. It does so much for one, but that is the most powerful antidote against the Yetzirah. Some people have a very powerful Yetzirah. There's all kinds of Yetzirim. The Torah is the best cure. What about women? So the rabbis tell us women have a tremendous zechut. If they support their husbands, if they kick them out of the house, go learn Torah. Because in that merit, you know, the whole house will be a Torah house. If the husband, who's the manager of the house, is uh, into Torah. So her job is to kick him out of the house and to encourage him and to basically convince him that this is very important. But what about her learning Torah? Women also can learn Torah. The Torah that applies to them, the halachot that apply to them, the midrashim that apply to them, but they don't need to learn the Gemara, they don't need to learn the Kabbalah. That does not apply to them. The woman's role is different than the man's role. The man's Yitzharim are different than the woman's Yitzharim. So therefore, the limited amount of Torah that they learn is, in, is enough for them. Maybe not enough for the man, but enough for them. As long as, of course, it is the Torah that is relevant to what she needs to know, the Halachot of Shabbat, of how to conduct herself, the Halachot of Tarat HaMishpacha, family purity, of Chala, how to be mafrish chala. There's certainly a that the women need to know more than the men because they are preoccupied in that. There's no doubt that women who support Torah, who give charity for Torah, and men as well, will have a part of the mitzvah of others who have learned Torah too. So a woman can definitely be involved in the Torah directly and indirectly. And it's important for them to know the basics too. What else do you find in the Torah? There's something else that you will find in the Torah. The rabbis tell us in in the beginning, in Bereshit, that HaKadosh Baruch Hu created the Or HaGanuz, the Or Sheganaz, a very special, powerful light, that if one would use it, he would be able to see things on the other side of the world. He would be able to know things that most ordinary human beings do not know. A tremendous light that would give one tremendous insights. Like Ruach HaKodesh. He put it away for Tzadikim, for after Mashiach comes, that is when they were gonna, they're going to enjoy this light. Why? Because there's too many Rishayim, too many wicked people in this world. Hashem does not want them to have any, anything to do with that light. Where is this light right now? The Zohar says at least part of that light is in the Torah. So when one learns Torah, he's also able to draw from that light. And that is why many great sages, Tzadikim, Hamidah Chachamim, were able to know things by divine inspiration, by Ruach HaKodesh, of course, just by learning the Torah. The Chazonish, Zechet Tzadik Lebracha, was once confronted with a very difficult situation. A man has to go th through surgery. They have to remove a tumor from his brain. And the rabbi not only gave him a blessing, but took out a piece of paper and told him, tell the doctor to cut on this side and to cut it this way. He says, Rabbi, did you ever go to college? He says, no. So how do you know this? It's all in the Torah. You go looking for it, and you may not find it. What could be, even though there's a lot of details in the Gemara about all sorts of things, it's the light of the Torah that gives, the, gives one the right insight about just about anything you want to know. But that's on condition that you learn Torah Lishma. What's the difference between Torah Shelo Lishma and Torah Lishma? The rabbis tell us a person should, can always learn Shelo Lishma because Shelo Lishma will bring you to Lishma. Shalolishma means not for its sake. You learn it because you want to be knowledgeable. You learn it because you're curious. Lishma means for its real sake. You learn in Torah because you want to do the will of Hashem. You want to do what's right. You want to be guided by the Torah. You want to be able to absorb all that light and, 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 be, and just do what you're supposed to do in this world. You know, was fulfill your mission. You want the Torah to be a light, right? That's the Lishma, for its true sake, for the sake of heaven. But not everybody begins by doing things for its true sake. A lot of people, for example, why are, they going to, why are they going to help their wives? Because they want their wives to help them. That's called Shalom Lishma. You want something in return, therefore you're willing to do something for her. 
what it should be is I do it for her because I love her, I care for her. It's the right thing. It, it, it makes sense. It's just correct. That's the real reason of why you should do something, right? So same thing with the Torah. But Rabbi says it's okay to start by doing it not for the real reasons because at least you'll get it started. And if you get started, eventually you will end up doing it for the real reasons. Torah Lishma obviously has many more benefits than Torah Shelo Lishma, but at least get started. And I guarantee it to everybody, even those who are Reformed and don't believe anything, if they learn the whole Torah, including the Midrash, the Halakha, the Gemara, the Shulchan Aruch, the Zohar, I have no doubts in the world, as long as they have a good attitude, eventually they will be Chozer B'Tshuva. They will repent, they will see the truth. There's so much inspiration to be gained by the lives of the rabbis, by, by, by their advice, by the, the vast amount of information, and that light that is there, that there's no doubt that they will, it will impact them, it will impress them. Now you will understand why of all the Yetzirara that he attempts to bring somebody down, you know where he works his hardest, where he brings his entire army, the Yetzirah? Somebody wants to come to a class. I don't know how much of a difficulty you had coming here tonight, but some men would love to see a basketball game instead. Some women would like to do whatever, something else, especially if it's late and especially if you're tired. There's a big Yetzirah to hold you back from coming. Why? Because the Yetzirah knows that this is the most powerful enemy, the most powerful weapon against him, that Torah. If that Jew or Jewess learns Torah, they're going to feel different. They're going to think different. That's going to be an antidote against me. It's going to weaken that Yetzirah. I don't want that. I'm going to put up a big fight. That's why I tell women, I'm sorry, I tell men, if your mother-in-law is coming to town and your wife says, you better pick her up. You know, she tells her, and that man, that husband, has a shiur Torah at that time. What does he do? Shalom bayit. Some people will claim, I have to have peace at home. I better do what my wife tells me and pick up my mother-in-law. But then the rabbi said, no, come learn Torah. That's more important. What do you do? My suggestion to those men that want to have shalom bayit and do the right thing by going to Torah, send a limousine to pick up your mother-in-law and, <laughs> and some beautiful roses too with it. And tell her, Mom, I'm sorry, I really like you and respect you, but I have a shiur Torah that I need to keep, and I need to be regular and consistent about it. But welcome home. <laughs> <laughs> what else are you going to do? You have, you, and you could win. If you do it right and tactfully, you will win. But, you know, be careful. You know, it's very sensitive here. We're talking about a mother-in-law, right? But that's the right thing to do because Torah should be regular. Kivuoti Timna Torah is something that is very much emphasized in Jewish tradition for the men more than, more than anything else. You have to be regular. The only way that Torah can be powerful is if you're regular and you don't give it up at any cost. Just want to fin Yes? The mother-in-law will understand very well. You send the limousine and send yeah. flowers. The yeah. mother-in-law will say very nice. Thank you. Yeah, I hope so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just want to finish with what Shalom Melech has told us and advised us, and this is very applicable, apropos for our time, that one should do his best, Asot Sefarim and Kits. The Jewish people should take upon themselves to publish as many books as they can, to disseminate this Torah. Torah is not only about learning, Torah is about giving it over, about preserving it. It's not enough to just receive the Torah, it's important to disseminate it. And that is why it's not a coincidence that this time of the year that we're looking forward to Kabbalah Torah. Looking forward, what does looking forward mean? Well, looking forward usually means I'm looking forward to something special, and that is why I count the days. Looking forward also means I want to be a part of this. I believe in this. Okay, great, that's a great idea. Then why at the same time that we're all looking forward to Kabbalah Torah did we lose 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva? during this time of the year. So much Torah was lost, at the same time we're looking forward to the Torah. Various explanations can be given, but one idea is, it's not enough to just receive the Torah. It's not, in, it's not enough to just learn it. We have to make sure that we preserve it, that we give it over to future generations. We have to make sure that we find the way to transmit it to our kids. Otherwise, we haven't fulfilled our obligation to just learn for ourselves. There are many Jews out there who have been deprived of a Jewish education, who do not even know how to say Shema Yisrael. And it is our job, because of Kol Yisrael Aravin Zelazeh, we're all responsible for each other, to find a way to give that information to them, to make it available, either with a disc, 
either by bringing them to Shur, by making a phone call. And this way we will have a tremendous big mitzvah in bringing the Torah to them and perhaps to their children and grandchildren. Thank you.